of care diagnostics have become an important part in the screening and treatment of infectious diseases. Every year, over 10 million people die from infectious diseases worldwide. 95% of these deaths occur in developing countries where resources are limited. Therefore, there is a great need for a low resource consuming and quick diagnostic device. Faster diagnostics would allow for earlier treatment and thus save lives. In addition, faster diagnostics would lower the overall healthcare cost by reducing the number of hospital visits necessary. Overall market value of point of care diagnostic devices was $13.8 billion in 2011 and is expected to increase to $16.5 billion in 2016. Detection of infectious diseases can't be accomplished through PCR-based diagnostic devices. Such devices extract DNA from a sample and amplify it so that it can be detected. The current technology for diagnosing infectious diseases is taking it to a centralized lab, which has limitations such as long test time, requires large amounts of reagents, it needs a large and stable power source, and it is expensive. Another type of technology is the chip-based microfluidic where it is, since it is pressure driven, it is an open system as opposed to a closed system, and the electrochemical system can't handle all types of biological samples. There has been great progress in the field of CD microfluidics. CD microfluidics is composed of a disc in which a centrifugal force drives fluid outward from the center. Traits of CD microfluidics include portability, simplicity, multitasking, compatibility with a variety of biological samples, and the fact that it's run by a simple motor. Lastly, CD microfluidics is a closed system, meaning that all the processes occur in a disk without the need of external sources. A CD microfluidic device consists of fluid chambers connected by fluidic channels. A complete point-of-care sample-to-answer CD microfluidic device can perform several main steps, including cell lysis and separation, PCR, hybridization, and detection. Each step is performed in a separate chamber. The first step is cell lysis. Cell lysis involves breaking apart a cell wall to extract the genomic or proteomic material from the cell. Cell lysis can be performed using biological or chemical agents such as chemical buffers, or it can be performed by applying mechanical force such as shear stress to a cell wall. This is achieved by using glass beads or magnetic beads. The next step involves the separation of DNA from the other components of the cell. DNA is separated from the other components of the cell by spinning the CD. Since DNA is lighter than the other components of the cell, it floats to the top of the chamber, where a connecting channel guides the DNA supernatant into the PCR chamber. At this stage, a buffer solution is mixed with DNA to perform PCR. The buffer solution consists of primers, free nucleotides, and TAC polymerase. After amplification, the DNA is sent to a hybridization chamber over a microarray where target probes attach to complementary DNA strands. The final step is where fluorescence detection can occur. A wash step is needed to remove any non-specifically adhered DNA. Additional chambers would be needed to hold reagents, buffer solutions, and waste from the PCR process. Valving technique is the most important function utilized on the microfluidic CD platform. Valving is necessary to control fluid flowing from one chamber to another. There are two valving systems, passive and active. Passive valving does not require any external mechanism for fluid to flow from an inner to an outer chamber, while an active valving requires external mechanism to accomplish this. Our goal is to develop valving technology for controlling fluid flow on a microfluidic CD platform. Ultimately, the microfluidic CD platform should be able to perform PCR-based molecular diagnostics. Valving technology must be simple, robust, reliable, and automated. Pictured here, we have SolidWorks drawings for our active valve wax design. Wax is, is colored red. Once the wax melts, it's designed to flow into the wax reservoir. The vent holes allow fluid to the fluid sample to be injected in and also to allow the wax to flow into the wax reservoir. Advantages of our design include portability, contacted and localized heating, inexpensive, inert, and biocompatible wax. We begin the fabrication of our CD by cutting the adhesive. To cut the adhesive, we import our CAD designs onto SignGo Light. We turn on the cutter plotter, lift the lever, center the origin, and begin cutting our design. After our design is cut, we use an X-Acto knife to remove two layers of adhesive from the center of the CD and the chambers and channels. We make sure that we carefully cut these layers.
Next, we mill our polycarbonate layer. We will use the milling machine and we will import our design onto Isopro. To cut the vent holes and the alignment hole, we will use the drill bit. After the drill bit is loaded, the machine mills the holes. Next, we load end mills into the machine. The uh, end mills cut the center of the CD and the perimeter of the CD. Once we have our top and bottom polycarbonate layers, we begin deburring polycarbonate. We now have two polycarbonate layers and an adhesive layer. Our next step is to put together our CD. We will use an alignment stand to align the polycarbonate with the adhesive layer. The following is the assembly process. To test the CD, we loaded the CD into the spin stand shown here. In order to spin the CD, we opened up LabVIEW and used a special PCR program. In order to melt the wax valves, the CD was first stopped and then the Peltier couples were brought up into contact with the CD. After about 30 seconds and the wax melted, the Peltier couples were lowered and the CD was spun again in order to move the wax, liquefied wax out of the way into the wax reservoir and to allow fluid to flow into the next chamber. This is a proof of concept of our wax chamber designs on a smaller CD. We were not able to film the results of the larger CD because the spin stand wasn't set up to film it. The CD is heated with a heat gun as it spun at 300 RPM. As you can see here, wax melts, flows into the designated wax channel. Some fluid also flows into the wax channel because the wax had solidified completely. After the wax melts, the CD is spun at 4,000 RPM and the fluid flows into the downstream chamber. Pictured here is our results table. In order to judge whether our tests were successful, we used a set of guiding questions. We answered these questions with a yes or no. From the results in the last two columns, we can tell that the wax did flow into the designated chamber, though it is not very reliable. In addition, fluid does flow into the next downstream chamber when the valve is open. So in conclusion, the Peltier couples were effective at melting wax. Wax and fluid flowed into their designated chambers. Overall, our active valving design using wax was successful.